Well, this is why you guys missed last week's episode. What are you doing? Stay tuned. I'll show you what you guys missed. We're coming back on the air. Last time on Graveyard Con. With so many areas of the shop, it's been nice to watch the growth of the employees. I mean, we've really got a great team right now. And even though it takes a little bit to tune them up and get them thinking, once you do take that time, they know how important it is to me. So it's, it's relaxing for me, and it's a peace of mind for me to know that they're doing their job. And that's going to help me to be able to get the cars done faster. We've got to make my clients happier and to be this more efficient. will remain on the air on this episode. So to compare the Barracuda Tribute with a real, real car, we've got our 1969 and a half Super B. So one of the things that this car requires is the accuracy and the authenticity of Mopar. That copy get you, Barbara. In Springfield, Oregon, dead Mopar muscle cars are coming back to life. Restored by Mopar master Mark Warman. I'm a liar and a bat now. His daughter, Alyssa Rose. <laughs> Why would you do that? His painter, Will Scott. Got one job. And his cousin, Dougie. Oh, hi, Mark. Welcome back to Graveyard Cars. So on our 1970 Plymouth Barracuda tribute car, we've already installed the drivetrain. Now, I took some time before the drivetrain got installed to go over the specific details of what steps we go to to make even a tribute car look accurate to what a real BS23 V-code car would be. This is a 1970 F440HP engine with a Silver Sport six-speed transmission and a Dana Mosier rear axle. This engine is going in a 70 Cuda tribute car. This is a graveyard dreams car. People ask if you're doing a tribute car and it's not a real V-code car in this situation, how authentic do you get? How detailed do you get? How close do you really want it to be? Are you trying to fool anybody? Well, the answer is yes, I am trying to fool a lot of people, but not for any monetary advance, all right? The VIN in the windshield is going to tell you that this car started life as a 318. The fender tag is going to confirm that it's a 318. Everything else about the car is gonna look like a 70 Cuda with a 446 barrel. So just to talk about that, upper radiator hose. That has the original part number, also the original texture, but well, not the one you get at your local parts store. This is a duplicate of the original. These are replicas of the spark plug wires with the date code on it. Original torsion clamps on the hoses. The 216 fan, which my friend Tony D'Agostino reproduces. And the date coded clutch, which also Tony happens to make. If you look at that right there, you'll see that there is a part number. Those are replicas of the original fan and power steering belts. That's the detail we go to. You open the hood, I don't want you to see anything except the way it should have started life if it was that particular car. You'll see that we use the natural finish on the dipstick tube with the painted dipped. See a nice little dot right there? That means that's been dipped. PCV valve and grommet both get painted with the engine in Hemi Orange. This is a correct throttle return bracket, throttle return spring, and throttle bracket for the 446 barrel manual transmission. Replica Holly six barrel carburetors with the correct screws. They come with a eight millimeter hex head screw, the new reproductions. We get these from Classic Industries and replace them before we put the carburetors on. We have the lead here going to the six pack idle stop, which I don't have yet, it's coming. If you look at the K member, that's an original K member with the skid plate. The lower control arms have the simulated Cosmoline effect that we put on all of them. Disc brakes, correct for a Super Track Pack car. This is gonna have a 410 day in it. It would be an A34 Super Track Pack. Replicas of the original black shocks with hardware, including the clip that holds a positive battery cable to the upper shock mounting bolt on the left-hand side of the car. Here you see an original sending unit for the rally instrument cluster. This is the correct original six barrel throttle cables that go on a 70 E body with a six barrel on it. Okay, so the same thing applies on this half of the engine as it did on the other half of the engine. That is correct original appearing. That's the name of the game. Whether your car's a G code for a 318 or a V code for a 446 barrel, when you pop that hood, if you're calling it a tribute, or a clone they used to call it, try to make it as accurate as possible. I, I guarantee you it's not a waste of money or time. Over here you see the heater hoses with the correct part numbers on them for the 1970 440 engine in a non-air conditioning E-body. Here on the coil you see it's got the original part number, the original color stamping, and the date code down here. Original Gates hoses, this is the 11 30 seconds black hose with the yellow writing on it. This is the one that goes over to the PCV valve. This is the one right here that goes over to the power brake booster. Because this car is a power disc brake car, we have to have that line going to it. From our friends at Inline Tube, these are the replicas, the original upper fuel lines that go into the six barrel carburetors. You could link it together any way you want. 
But if you want it to be right, that's the part you need on there. Looking down here, you'll see the KV fuel line. This is the main incoming line, 3 eighths. The outgoing one is 5 sixteenths, but it also has KV on it. And this is the quarter inch fuel return line. And it goes back to the fuel tank. And then this is the fuel vapor separator. So when you look at this engine, everything about it from a DNA standpoint is accurate for 1970 CUDA 440 six barrel. Originally, this engine would have had a 18 spline Hemi four speed behind it. Now you've probably seen the transmission back here. The cool thing about the transmission is this is from Silver Sport. It's a six speed T56 Magnum transmission. You can buy this whole thing in a kit. It's scatter shield, the clutch, the flywheel, the transmission, you get the shifter. Here's the coolest part of this particular transmission. Number one is it bolts right into your car. Very few modifications to the floor. You do have to cut out a couple of small areas to be able to fit this transmission in there. We'll show you that when the time comes. It's this. This is the gold. Gold, Jerry, gold. So originally it had a pistol grip four speed with wood grain handles on it and a lens indicator on the top that would have a four speed pattern. This comes out exactly in the same position that a factory E-body four speed would come out. No modifications back there at all. They've modified its shifting area from here all the way back to here and off to the left because Mopars are off center. They've included a carbon fiber, which isn't my cup of tea, but the folks that own the car happen to love it. It's the lens on the top that I think is so cool. The same font, the same pattern, except that it's six speed. So I grab that bad boy. First, look at the throw. Second. Typically, it's more like this. There's, this is about 50% shorter throw. First, second, go into third, fourth, fifth, sixth. And then back to the neutral gate, over to the right and up is reverse. That's just gonna make one nice driving car. So there you go. 446 barrel tribute with a six speed transmission done the way Graveyard Cars does everything. The right way. So to compare the Barracuda tribute with a real, real car. We've got our 1969 and a half Super B. Now this car's been around a long time and I'm sorry to say that. We've moved a couple of times, got a lot of things happen. The, the owner's been very patient with us, but doesn't avoid the fact that we've had the car way too long and it's time to finish it. Connecting with ECS has allowed me to be able to get carpet sets for our cars. We were always able to get them, but the ones that we're getting from them come in a great big flat box. This thing is not folded up. In this particular case, you open it up out of the box, you lay it in there, you use a quick seam across it just to make sure you hit all the contours, and all of a sudden you've got a factory 80-20 identical carpet set to what you had if you would have bought the car brand new. They make these carpet sets a little bit long, which is smart because sometimes you have to do that. They know that we make mistakes out here in the world, so if we trim the end of it off, put it in there and find out that it's still too long, you can keep trimming it. You can't, it's like hair, if you get a bad haircut, I rarely do, but if you were to get a bad haircut, it would be difficult to glue that hair back on. All right, you cut a board too short, you can't glue the wood back on. So in this case, they give you plenty and you just take your time and trim it. Between trimming it, steaming it, and fitting it, you should be able to make it look exactly the way it did, or better, when the car was new. One of the most difficult cuts that you need to make sure that you have everything perfectly lined up is actually where the shift mechanism comes through. You gotta get that right, because that's right in the center and nothing really covers that. You only get a maybe about an inch of grace when cutting that for the shift boot to go over, but if you go anything further past that, you're calling them up and asking for a new carpet. The carpet looks fantastic in there. You know, made all the cuts, got everything lined up, lays down super flat, and I just can't wait to move on to the next part. So now that I got the carpet in, we can move on to the rest of the interior. We can actually get the dash in there, get the trim panels on the door, hopefully get some seats in there. We are getting ready to install the OEM exhaust system on our 69 and a half A12 car. If you go back to the early seasons of Graveyard Cars, I did an inventory check on this car. We went around it from the very front to the very back, talking about the things that make it a real A12 car, some of the footprints that we needed to record so for when times like this come and we're putting it back together, we would have that documentation. It's a very unique packaged car and it deserves to be done right. So for example, the exhaust system that I put on this Barracuda needs to look sound and act right. 
It doesn't have to be perfect. The Super B, it does have to have that. So one of the things that this car requires in my mind, and in the mindset of avid A12 followers, is the accuracy and the authenticity of Mopar. So we reached out to ECS. They're the company that make our decal kit. The exhaust system is what I fell in love with when I first saw them. I saw it at SEMA a couple of years ago, and we've had discussions about what's the difference between the real, real righteous ones and the ones that are fine and they're great and they're affordable in other cases, but if you want a really righteous car, what makes this right? So after learning that, I've decided to use those systems on our cars from here on out. It's a nice looking pipe, right? Yeah. The ones we've used in the past, the cold rolled steel, which is the factory ones, they're also a nice looking pipe, mm -hmm. right up to the point where you run them a few times and they get wet and they rust. Yeah. So this system looks and appears completely OEM from the finish standpoint, but it's actually made of stainless steel. The main thing that I think is so sexy on this system are all these bins, mm -hmm. how the shoe has made all of the duplicated exact bins where they're supposed to go. But the interesting part of it is the things they added that are cosmetic so that it would appear OEM. So if you flip it over, first off, you see this seam? Yeah. That's a factory weld seam okay. all the way down the pipe, just like the original cold rolled steel ones. Aluminized ones don't have that. Huh. So if you're doing an original one, you definitely want to make sure that you have that seam so it looks right. Now, this is the cool part. This flat spot that you see on both sides, mm -hmm. this is where it goes underneath the torsion bar cross member for clearance. Okay. Another key thing that you don't see on a lot of systems is this flat spot right here. So you know how the torsion bar comes right here and on a lot yeah. of systems, this comes over, it doesn't have the sink in it, and so it'll hit that. The, the way the engine works on torque is you put it in gear and you drop the clutch, it wants to walk up on the left, so this will walk right up and smack into the torsion oh, yeah. bar. This gives you an extra, probably almost an inch. So that line right there is 100% faster. That's really nice to have. <clears throat> oh, it's great, yeah. It looks right and it actually serves a purpose. Yeah. And then here, you see these shoe marks right through here. These are all factory. Even the factory ones have it from clamping it in the machine. Mm -hmm. The shank down. The really nice collapse shank down right there for the mufflers to yeah. go on. Yeah. It's not cut or split or, you know, re reduced down. Yeah, by it's, it. it's a factory system. It's just beautiful. So, you That's ready excellent. to install a pipe? Yeah, let's put it in. Let's do it. Okay. So, while we have used in the past good exhaust systems that work great, they're not licensed by Chrysler. They're not so accurate to an original one that you could get a license and put a Pentastar on it. But on a car like that, that's why it's going on that one and that's what that car deserves. 1966 was the first year for the Dodge Charger. Now, originally this car was supposed to be a turbine car. The turbine engine project failed, so the turbine Charger failed along with it. However, it was a great looking car, a great design. Chrysler had a lot of money invested in it. They decided to continue to produce it with a conventional engine. The standard engine, the 66 Charger, was a 318. Optionally, you could get the 361 two barrel, which also happened to be the last year for the 361. The 383 four barrel was also optional in the 66 Charger. What other engine could you have gotten this car? Is it the 440 Magnum, the 426 Hemi, the 446 pack. Think you know that answer? Stay tuned after the commercial break. I'll let you know how you did. The very first year for the Dodge Charger is 1966. Like this one right here. The standard engine was a 318, we learned that. The 361 two barrel was available in this year and model, as was the 383 four barrel. What was the other engine that was available in this model? Was it 440 Magnum, 426 Hemi, 446 pack? If you guess 446 pack, you're crazy. You're wrong and you're crazy because 1969 and a half was the very first year in the A12 cars for the 446 back there and 90 horsepower, three Holley two barrel carburetors totaling 1,350 CFM. If you said 426 Hemi, that was the other available engine. They only built 268 426 Hemi 1966 Dodge Chargers. Of those, like this one being a four speed, they made 250, only 218 automatics. So. I can keep doing the number thing all day long, doesn't matter to me. 
I got nothing but numbers rolling around. You see that movie, A Beautiful Mind, where they got the guy standing in front of the board and all the numbers are going off and he's calculating it all. That's every day of my life. Like Terminator, the numbers are jumping up and down and looking for matches. Now the guy in Beautiful Mind, he had, he had a nervous breakdown or something, right? I haven't had a nervous breakdown. That was... Okay, so we're ready to put the mufflers on. That means a, a little bit of hardware. Mm -hmm. Now you've seen the other uh, clamps that we used to use. They'd have a flange nut where the washer was built onto it. Yeah. Which works great, but it isn't correct. Yeah. This is actually the correct uh, setup for the hardware. Correct size, correct finish. You see they're oily? Yeah. They're a natural finish from the factory. So the ones that we get are zinc plated a lot of times. That's uh -huh. not correct. This is actually correct, but they put the oil on to prevent it from rusting. Okay. These are what I am in love with. Natural finish, that's why they're oily. Yeah. The correct band, correct, I believe, rubber band hmm. with the double sewing in it. But that stud, that stud, go look at an original one. That hollow rivet. Oh, yeah. That's all factory, where the, the generic ones that you get don't have any of that. Yeah, I think it's just bolted on the generic ones. And see how this is stamped into it? Mm -hmm. Normally, this is just flush and you bolt it on there. Yeah. This is as close to an NOS part as you could get. Just doesn't have a part number on really it. Really nice. And then the muffler is super cool. So these are double wrap number one. So you got your outer skin. They actually have another skin underneath it. Okay. Wow. And that's what gives them the Hemi muffler deepness. You notice how a lot of mufflers we put on, they sound more tinny like the Magnaflow, or, yeah, which is yeah. a great sound, but it's not a factory sound. Yeah. This will offer you the factory sound. Mm -hmm. These are the only that are licensed by Chrysler. That's why you only see the Pentastar there. To get there. the stamp and everything So if on you there. want to do it right, you do it like that. So you got your vendor code, your date code. So this would be the 27th day of 69. Okay. Which is great because this is a spring car. So this yeah. is plenty. This is two, three months before the car was built. Another vendor code, which internally means something to the people that made them originally. Yeah. But these are built and based on original. Okay. And the font, that's the other thing. Identical. That is the identical font, wow. right? But here's something nobody pays attention to. The aftermarket ones have one weep hole. This has two. That muffler is not specific to either side of the car. So it could set this way, and it has to set a certain way on the left-hand side of the car. You could take that same muffler, flip it over, and put it on the other side. That's how it's intended to be. It's yeah. just that attention to detail is so important. That's really good. The indentions are beautiful. This is for the purpose of clearing the drive shaft during vibration, uh -huh. but these are all duplicates. However they did it, I don't know, but somebody studied yeah. it like a science, and yeah. so you have all the indention marks, you have the correct muffler, you have the correct date codes, the Pentastar. Everything about this is gonna look like an NOS system. The owner will be just thrilled. That's great. So, so this system is a great example of what it would be like if you could go back in time and buy the entire system brand new from Chrysler. At the end, it goes on easy. It looks exactly the way it should. And you know that if you go to a show, there's nobody at any show in any class that's gonna have a better system on their car. The 1971 CUDA tribute car that I introduced recently is about to have its final metal work done on it. So you know which car this is. It's the one that I bought it because it was a real 71, but the only thing really salvageable, besides all the bolt-on stuff, like very restorable headlights, taillights, grill, interior, that's invaluable stuff. So that's why we bought it. Of course, it would have been nice if the body was in mint condition, but I mean, a donor car like that in mint condition would be maybe $30,000, $40,000. I mean, it's just, they're hard to find. They're hard to find. So that's why we built the one that we're building. So far, George and I, over the last few nights, have built out the entire body completely from one end to the other, but only screwed together and clamped together, not solid welded together. And the reason we pre-built the car out was we want to know where everything goes before we start welding it in because we're gonna film it and let you guys see it. We are going to walk through from the rear frame rails, front frame rails, transmission cross member. Then we're gonna do floors, extensions, trunk floor, trunk floor extensions, rear step wells, cowl, firewall, upper body, set the roof down on it. You're going to virtually see this car be built before your eyes. Without a doubt, this is the most intricate build we've ever done. It's not the most high dollar build we've ever done. With cars becoming more and more obsolete, but graveyard cars wanting to stay in business for 30 more years, we've got to look for an alternative, and this could be the alternative. If we can get a manufacturer like Auto Metal Direct to build some of the inner structure pieces for the roof that they're not building right now, we could build a car out of a catalog. 
So when we're done putting this car together, you're gonna see a completely built out Tribute 1971 Hemi Cuda Shaker Hood Car. Okay, so the very first step we've got to do in building out this entire car are some of the sub panels. So like the wheelhouse, uh, the inner and the outer need to be spot welded together like the factory did. The inner and outer rockers, they need to be spot welded. We know where they go, we pre-fit everything. So I'm gonna help George. It's kind of a two guy job, especially with the spot welder, holding it, making sure nothing moves. Once we do that, we can move over, start setting the frame down on the car, put the rockers in place. Those are structural pieces you have to have in place before you can move forward. So how do you feel about it? I like excited. You asleep again? Oh, George is excited. Doing excited. good. Did you name that zit in your forehead yet? Yes, it is. Yeah. It's Mark. called Martina. Yeah, I knew it was. All right, let's work on this thing. This is the inner wheelhouse. This is the part right here on the back side of it. I'll just put it like this. If this was in the car, the trunk floor would be between here and the other wheelhouse. So this is called the inner. This is the outer wheelhouse. It's going to marry up against it. This opening right here is exactly the opening of the 70 to 74 CUDA. So there are alignment holes that manufacturers put in, like these here, throw them out the window. None of it matters. What you want to do is make sure when you line it up, give you an idea. So in this case, you can see there's a hole right there. I'm going to line it up with the hole underneath it. Doesn't have to be too tight, but just in there. Okay, and then down here on this end, this hole represents our other locating hole that we use. Remember, we've already set these into a car and in place, so we know we've already taken the time to make sure how everything fits so we can just move forward with our spot welder. So George, I will line up that hole right in that range. Go ahead and set that one. Okay, now what we care about is in here. This plane and this plane should be right next to each other. It should be a nice flush finish all the way through there. Fantastic, okay, so now we're ready to spot weld. We're almost done. together the inner and outer rocker panels. This is the right hand outer rocker. See how it's shaped? This is the part you see from outside the car underneath the door. That's what we call a rocker panel. Right here, this is the sill area. So when you open your door, you see that nice sill plate that covers the edge of the carpeting? That's this area right through here. So it's called the outer rocker. And this is the inner rocker. This is the reinforcement that when married together, boxes it in. There's nothing better than boxed in steel. That's gonna give you all of the strength that you need. So go ahead and give me a clamp right there. We have our screw holes lined up. We're gonna do the top of it first, and then we'll put the bottom in place as we need to. Again, it's really easy for these things to walk around on you and do this. So you just wanna make sure that these two lips are the same height all the way down. The other side isn't, as you can tell, it's sticking way up here on the outer rocker. We'll, we'll address that once this is welded into place. All right, black marker, I'll give you some guidelines. There we go. Put you one. Every couple of inches. I love to have too much. It's much better than not enough. Same thing applies. Just gonna use a spot welder to marry these panels together, starting at the beginning. Okay, we got the top half of it welded up. So here, you guys can see that this lip is sticking up. The outer rocker, which is closest to me, is above the inner rocker. Can you see that little lip right there? What we want to do is we want to be able to push this down so they're lined up perfectly before we do our spot welding on the bottom. There we go. Okay, we got her. Okay, are those two coming together now? Yep, nice.
So all we've got to do now is the same thing. We're going to spot weld from this end to this end, about two inches apart. Once this is done, we can move it down to where the car is going to be put together at, along with the wheelhouses. He still has one more rocker to do, but you've seen how it goes. So with that, I'm going to let you start spot welding. Thank you. All right. Here to help you any way I can. You believe that, don't you? Oh, yeah. 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 All right, so we just got our dash assembly back for our 69 and a half, 446 pack, four speed, 410 Dana, Super B. The same high bar is set, right? It has to look right. Instrument Specialties got it shipped out last week. We just received it today. Uh, it's a beautiful piece of equipment like all of their stuff is. So I want to take a few minutes before we put the dash in and show Justin some of those things, the intricate stuff that you wouldn't even pay attention to unless somebody was pointing out. So he knows what the difference is between just making something look good and doing it right. This dash, if you look at the texture, uh -huh. one of the things I want to point out is how accurate that is. People spray these all the time. They'll use all kinds of hokey little products to try to duplicate the factory. This is an original lacquer paint yeah. with suede, which is a discontinued paint and a discontinued mm. toner. That's why Mike Mancini charges a little bit for it, because you can't get it anywhere else. This yeah. is the last step I mean, on I've, it. I've even tried duplicating it's that, hard. too. And it, it's hard. You can get it close, but never right. Working in the dash area, I just want to point out, this is not new reproduction parts from Classic Industries. There's nothing wrong with those new reproduction parts from Classic Industries, especially when the originals are not available. Yeah. But if you're a professional and you're charging top dollar, then you don't put reproduction parts on when you can re-chrome and replace. Restore as much as you can. And that's what they've done. Okay, yeah. Every knob that you see, this button for the switch, mm -hmm. these are all re-chromed originals. Wow. This is the original faceplate and it's all re-chromed with hand-done lettering. Yeah, last time Mike was in here, he actually talked about how they used a, a cigarette butt filter. That's right, he did. And uh, I always used my finger, thing. and he said, See, yeah. I never even thought about it, but yeah. that's, yeah. Chrome here is new, reset knob. Great time to check it. Black well, how do they do that? How do they get the re-chrome on there? They chrome the, the whole thing, okay. and then they black it out. Oh, and then they black it out. Yeah, gotcha. if you just look at the gauges, these that's the original mileage right there. Oh, so he opted not to switch it back to zero. When, yeah, when his dad last drove the car, that was the mileage, and I think that's such a great that's, tribute yeah, to so his cool. father. It's a blessing that I got Mike Manzini back at Instrument Specialties to do our dash for us. When he restores these dash assemblies, the care to do it right and to duplicate the factory is unprecedented. They don't put decals over the faces of these instruments. They do the original photochemical process. This is something he's the only guy in the country doing, but when it's done, it looks with the same finish, the same font, exactly the way back in the day those instrument panels were done. 50 years later, it gives you an exact appearing and lasts exactly the same as the old school ones did. The radio, Knobs have been completely rechromed, bezel rechromed, hand lettered. Same thing with the temperature, the switches. He takes time to rechrome all the original chrome work on it. He doesn't just buy new ones and put on there. These are the original ones. And when these guys do it, it's always 100% accurate. If you look at the key, these are brand new blanks of the original. These are new old stock keys. Oh, just make them that identical. they make an extra yeah. set for. We had as originals, but those are new. The ashtray is the original receiver. It just happens to have been re-zinc plated, has the original correct texture on it, like the rest of the dash. Wow. Cigarette lighter is a new old stock. Notice the little ribs on the side there. Oh, yeah. That's an original lighter. It's amazing how much goes into one of these, but that's why they charge what they do. <laughs> Even right down to the knob for the glove box door oh, wow. is replated. I'm excited to see this go in the guy's car. He's oh, been waiting so be patient for us. Awesome guy. I can't wait to listen to that. Dave, he's an awesome guy. Dave's an awesome guy. He came out here in season two and hung out for a week. Oh, well. He packed his bicycle up in a knapsack and it bolted it together when he got here and rode it all over town. The guy's like Is super it? healthy. He worked oh, for it. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not me, man. <laughs> okay, just take a quick look through here. They use a new reproduction wiring harnesses, which are great. Again, classic industries. That's just the ones that anybody can get to, yep. right? Okay. Yeah. And you should always, if you can, do it. Just because the wiring harnesses that are on these cars are 50 years old, they're brittle, people have whacked into them before for oh, yeah. stereo or gauges. What you'd hate to do is spend $100,000 restoring a car, have this beautiful car burned to the ground. Yeah. It's over a $500 wiring uh -huh. harness. 
All right, so just before we put the dash in, I wanted to show you a couple of provisions that you have to have in place before you put the dash in. This is the original heater box just restored. We put a new heater core in it, a new seal kit, new cables. We reproduce the original part number. If you look at the original part, you'll see that that number was on there. This is a duplicate of that. So that's the attention to detail. If somebody crawls underneath your car to show with a flashlight, they're gonna wanna see that. The under dash insulation, all cars got that. This car gets it. Kick panel insulation, we wanna add that. Look up in here, you see the wiper transmission has been blasted and clear coated, so it's safe, it's not gonna rust. We have uh, all the joints have been greased, lubed. Clutch and brake pedal assembly, you see the black mark and then the natural finish from there up. All of that is restored, in place, and ready for that dash to go in. Just make sure you have that before you put your dash in or you'll be taking your dash back out later. So since you're younger than me, I'm gonna let you crawl through. Okay, that sounds good. <laughs> I always make the young guy do that. I could do it. I just look pretty ugly doing it. I think we all would. <laughs> <laughs> well, the older you get, the uglier you get doing it. Royal tries to do it like it's no problem at all, but you can tell by the look on his face, it's a problem. Real struggle. Huh? <laughs> yeah, but I give him credit for trying. All right. God, beautiful. All of a sudden, what, six bolts, seven bolts, and it's a car again? Yep. Take your time. I'll let you hook your side first. Okay. And let me get my hand out. Okay, I'm there. You on there? Okay. Yep. I'll just sit here and Great. hold it up for you. Start making connections. All right. This is my favorite part of the job right here. Just hold it up. Laying down on the job, huh? Hold it up, holding it up. Hold the line, holding the line. Sometimes when it comes to stuff like this, you just need an extra set of hands. This thing, what do you think this weighs? If you had to guess. 50? Yeah, probably 50 pounds, 60 pounds. It's not bad. It's just awkward. I've done one of these by myself before. It's not fun. Hello, GoPro. I'm just waving at a GoPro back there. See, this is what I do when you're in your 13th season of Graveyard Cars. You can acknowledge the camera. I don't care. It's a camera. Do what I want. People say that I'm very much like David Brin or Michael Scott, whatever, you know. I just do what I do. Right? Like Popeye the Sailor Man. I am what I am, and that's all that I am. Let me get this speedo, speedo cable on. All right. Okay, I'll get this first one in here. We can get. All there right. Go. There we go. There we go, yo. And that's how we put a dash in a 69 and a half Super B. So we have our dashboard now installed in the 69 Super B. Everything looks great. Connections are all made. Able to roll it up into place and bolt it down. So now we can just move on building out the rest of the interior. We can get the steering column installed in it. You can start building out the back seat area, door trim panels, front seats. We're ready to move forward with the rest of the assembly on Johnson 69 and a half Super B. The 1970 Plymouth Superbird was born out of necessity. In order for Plymouth to run their new car at NASCAR in 1970, they had to build one street version for every two dealerships in the country. There were around 4,000 dealerships at that time, so around 2,000 cars had to be built. Between 1920 and 1935, Superbirds were built. There is no conclusive answer. True or false, all Superbirds came with a 426 Hemi and a four-speed transmission. If you think you know the answer, stay tuned after the break. We'll let you know how you did. So oh this chick walks in. I Every time I go over here, a body man gets his wing. Yeah, here's all this one coming. The trusty old Mission Impossible gag. Okay, okay. No, I, what's I tried to have him killed. Nothing. You don't, nothing. Nothing. <laughs> you don't oh just God. turn it off. Screw this, pal. I'm getting us out of here. Hey, has this been here the whole time? Lord, if you get me out of this, I promise I'll never even think about going to a party on the West Coast. Okay, it was me. I'm the one that stole your car, but Will did make me do it. Don't listen to her. She's lying. I didn't tell her to do It's okay, baby. It's okay. We're gonna get out of here. I'm 
gonna die and I don't even get my last meal. Pretty clever, Warman. Personally, I'd have done three layers of polycarbonate with a flexible titanium. Shut, Shut up, up Sam. Sam. Time's up. My ghoulish friends, how did we do on that one? Now, if you've been watching Graveyard Cars, you remember back to season three, I think it was, where we restored a super bird. We talked about a lot of numbers during that time. My question was, of the street versions of the super bird that were built, whether it was 1920 or 1935 or somewhere in between, true or false, they were all 426 Hemi four-speed cars. If you said false, if you said I'm a liar, you said I'm a fat mouth, and that's why my nose looks like Pinocchio's. You are absolutely right. The Superbird standard engine was a 375 horsepower 440 Super Commando, available with both a four speed and an automatic transmission. The first optional engine was the 446 barrel V code, also available with a four speed transmission and an automatic transmission. The legendary R code 426 Hemi was available in the 1970 Plymouth Superbird. Of the four speeds, 58 were built. Of the automatic, 77 were built. Making a Hemi option Superbird, especially with a four speed, one of only 58, could very easily be a seven figure car in today's world. All right, so I'm gonna go get George and we're gonna begin the final assembly of the 71 Hemi Cuda Tribute car. We talked about what dire straits this car was in when I got it, but that the most valuable thing was it was a complete car and how valuable that roof inner structure stuff is because nobody makes it. Right here is the rear shock cross member. So to give you an example, put it into perspective, let's turn it over, George. If this is in the back of the car, your rear shocks come right up through here and this bolt locates them into place. This is called a rear shock cross member. <clears throat> it does not come on the frame rails already. I had to put that on there. But the reason I like to do it now, while it's all apart, is we have accessibility to it. Here you can see I have really nice welds all through here. You couldn't do that normally speaking when it's on the car. You can't even tell that we welded it in these areas right here. We also did a measurement to make sure that they were perfect where they're supposed to go. So this sub-assembly is ready to install. This is a Graveyard Dreams car. It's hard to find 71 Barracuda bodies. That's why we went to such great lengths on this one, but you're gonna learn some really neat stuff that you've never seen before on Graveyard cars. If you wanna grab the trunk pan, we'll get ready to set it up here in a minute. Sounds good. This is a weld through primer like we've mentioned before. It'll put a seal around our welds. All right, go ahead and throw that pan up there. and We'll give you a hand. All right, there you go. Thank you. You're welcome. These are the areas that we're gonna be spot welding onto the frame rails. So we wanna put some weld through primer on that. They've already been stripped. And then you got a tape measure handy. We can do a measure off this rail right here. Boy, it's really close right there. George and I have taken that car and we've actually pre-built it out. Everything in place to look like a real life car, everything was screwed together. That gives us the ability, number one, to look at it and make sure that it's geometrically square and true. But also we have those locator holes now that it's time to go back together with it for final. Because now's the time when this car gets welded up. I believe that is it right there. Those holes are lined up nicely. That's lined up. Perfect. So right now we have the trunk pan sitting in space where it's supposed to go. So we're gonna spot weld this in a couple of areas to the frame rails, double check it with a cross measure one more time, and then we can spot weld it almost all the way forward. We'll stop around here because we still have to put the other panel over the top of it, the under seat pan. 
that's going really well. Beautiful. We'll go ahead and go do the other side. Keep it from moving around too much on us. It's a long process to do the spot welding, but we're gonna start and see how far we can get. So today I'm getting ready to install and build out the quarter trim panels and the door panels on the 69 and a half Super B. So our interior trim panel, in fact, all of our upholstery on the inside other than the carpet set came from uh, Classic Industries and these are exact replicas of the originals. So before you put one of these on, you wanna make sure that you actually have your retaining clips in here for the, the screws um, that hold your armrest in place. So if you got those in there, the interior door trim panels are beautiful. They're heat pressed just like the factory ones are. So when you stand back and look at them, they look the way they're supposed to, except they're not 50 years old. You get this put on. This just slides up right into the beauty trim. Just want to be careful. You don't snag these corners or anything. If you snag them, if you got to pull it off and readjust, um, you could end up tearing the material and start kind of lining up your, your clips. Let's start with the top. Move on to the front, press that up into place. You can kind of feel through to see if they're lining up together. Another thing too is make sure you press right where that clip is. You can kind of feel it behind. If you don't, it can push through and kind of protrude through your trim panel. There we go. We go to next is our armrest. You want to make sure that you have this level, you know, with the door. Once it's lined up, go ahead and do your final tight. Then you can move on to the door handle. This is the first Super B I've, I've uh, gotten to work on. Gotta say, I really like these cars. Just got their door handle on there. Now we can set on our window crank handle. An interesting little note, I've been to car shows since I was 15 years old. Back then, I didn't pay attention but I sure do now, and that is the location of the window cranks. I think a window crank can be put on anywhere, 360 degrees, just where, where do you want it? Where does it feel good? Where's, well, there are actually factory positions for it. So when you're sitting in the passenger seat and you roll that window up, that thing should stop at seven o'clock. If you were looking at a clock face, wherever seven o'clock is, that's where that handle should stop. Five o'clock on the driver's side, boom because you're on the opposite side of the clock, right? All right, those are the important little details when they go to a show, whether the windows are up or down, you have to have those cranks in the right position. So I got the door trim panels on, I got the armrests, the uh, door handle, and the window crank levers. Everything went on really nice. That's probably the best one so far. Everything just fell right into place. It's really awesome to be able to work on something that just goes together so, so smooth.